So we're starting a series, uh, Working in the Supernatural. We've been doing this series on the supernatural for the last two months. Uh, we describe the supernatural as a manifestation or an event attributed to some force beyond scientific understanding or the laws of nature. We, we describe that when God does something in our sphere that we cannot easily understand or explain, not that it doesn't have an explanation, but we just cannot explain it in the parameters that we're already and normally used to, we call it a supernatural occurrence or a supernatural event. Amen. If something deviates from the normal course of nature, it's, it's supernatural. Without, you know, there are things that can deviate from the normal course of nature by the hand of men. That would not be supernatural. For example, when I was growing up, I used to know that for you to have chicken, okay, uh, at home, you would have laid an egg and the chick would have grown and maybe what? I don't know, hatched and for another maybe six months or eight months or so, it would mature and then you can kill it and then you can eat it. But after a while, I began to find chicken that went from egg to the pot in four weeks. <laughs> That's a bit abnormal, but it was done by the hands of men. However, God can take something that is not the normal way and bring it to pass in the same manner, but that would be supernatural. So the supernatural is God or something out of our normal realm influencing our realm. For example, somebody can show you favor just from the motivation and the goodness of their heart. That would be a natural thing. However, God can influence a man who has no business favoring you to show you favor. That would be supernatural. Are you understanding me? It is favor you have been shown, but the source makes the difference. So when heaven comes down to earth, we say the supernatural is at work. When heaven interrupts the order of earth to bring something to pass for you, for me, in our system, it is supernatural. So it's a manifestation or event attributed to some force beyond our nature, beyond our scientific understanding, beyond our natural law. Are you with me so far? For us as Christians, the supernatural is very real to us. The supernatural is very, very real to us. And so, uh, we were talking about us as believers walking in the supernatural as our normal order of life. Amen. There are forces that act, there are beings that act upon our world to bring about a supernatural event. And so in teaching this, we explained the fact that God, the Godhead, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they influence our world in order to bring about supernatural events. We, we said that angelic beings influence our world in order to bring about a supernatural event. Satan himself, who is a rebel angel, so to speak, if influences our world in order to bring about supernatural events. Demonic beings influence our world in order to bring about supernatural events. So the, the, the chart that you see up is basically showing you the spiritual beings, the spiritual entity that brings about a supernatural event in our world. And as, actually, as I was looking at this chart yesterday, I, I suddenly realized something. And that thing was this. All of these entities on this chart are spiritual beings. You, as a human being, you are spiritual. Amen. That is why you can experience the supernatural, because you are a spiritual entity. And then I suddenly realized that it is not only God and angelic beings and Satan and demons who influence us. We also have an influence on them. In fact, this is what makes it possible for you to walk in the supernatural. Because that's what we're going to be talking about very soon. It is because you can influence God to act on the earth. 
you can influence angelic beings to act on your behalf. And you can influence the devil. The Bible says you can cast him out. You can resist him. You can tell him to leave your life alone. You can cast out demons. In fact, one of the primary authority Jesus gave to us was power to cast out demons. So as believers, it is not only that the supernatural influences us, we can also influence the supernatural. And we need to learn how to do that. Are you still with me? We must learn how to do that. So it's a two-way street. In fact, God has made it such that he does not act on the earth except there is a man or a woman who will compel him to. God has made it such that he will not act in your life except you have given him permission to do so. I have often explained it this way. It's like if I bought a house, I'm the owner of the house, and if I rented it out to another person, they become the occupant of that house. They don't own it, but they occupy it. I cannot just walk in anytime I want and anytime I like and say, I have come to my house. Are you understanding me? They have the right to call the police to call <laughs> and get me out. Be even though it my, it's my property, it belongs to me, by the right of tenancy, I can't just do whatever I want there. I have to take their permission in order to go in there. How many of you understand that? That's the way the earth is. In fact, in Psalm 115 or 116, it says the heavens belongs to the Lord, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. So God created the heavens and the earth and gave us the earth as tenants. We are the occupants of this earth. Therefore, by that right, God cannot violate our right to come in and just do whatever he please on earth. Are you understanding me? So we have to give him permission in order to move supernaturally in our world. And the same applies to your life. You have to give him permission in order for him to walk in your life. There are many people who say, well, if God loves me, why hasn't he done, done this and that in, in my life? And God is saying, well, I love you, but you've never given me permission to walk in your life. Why? Because he gave you your life and you're a free moral agent. If you say, God, I don't want to have anything to do with you, so be it. He wouldn't do nothing in your life. Amen. In the same way, the devil is exactly the opposite. He does not need your permission to oppress you. In fact, he, he plans so that you are oblivious of the fact that he is violating your right. <laughs> He does exactly the opposite of what God will do. Demons can inhabit a person and oppress the person without their permission at all. That's why the Bible calls them wicked spirits. And then what we do is to teach you your right. And then you're able to say, no, 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 I will not let this continue in my life. You ought to be out now. That's why you cast out demons. You don't beg them to leave. Because they don't want to leave. They want to keep violating your rights. Are you understanding me? Uh, this is just an introduction. So we as human beings, we are spiritual entities. And we can influence the spiritual atmosphere around us. We can exert an influence on God. Even though that sounds counterintuitive. You know, God is almighty. You can't really influence him. But yes, I understand what you mean by that. But he has made it such that by his own principles, by his own laws, he has restricted himself to a certain sphere. And if he's going to act on your behalf and in your life, he requires your permission. So yes, in a way, we can influence God. In fact, that's the force of prayer. Prayer is us authorizing God to act on our behalf. Prayer is our mechanism to influence God. It is, it, it, in fact, that's why the Bible calls it petition. It is your right. You, you know, there are many people who love writing petitions. They, they, they are angry at everything the government does. So they they. How many of you get all those signed these petitions, <laughs> those links? <laughs> Why? Because those people recognize that petitions are a mechanism to influence people that are in authority. That's how prayer is. It's a petition that you can use to influence the authorities that be. Amen. 
The supernatural is real. How many of you know that? The supernatural is real. Angels are real. In fact, angels are gathered with us right now. Right now. Right now. And it is very real to us. We know it and we must take advantage of it. Amen. Angels are so real and their effect and their works in our lives are so real but if we are not cognizant of that fact, we may go through all of our lives without even benefiting from their effects, from their missions, from the fact that God has given them to minister to us. It says they are ministering spirits sent to minister to those who will become the heirs of salvation. Angels are very real. The supernatural is real to us. And so, in the last two months, we talked about understanding the supernatural because we wanted you to at least understand that there is something more than just us. Understand the Godhead, angelic beings, Satan, and demons, and the fact that they're, they're out there to influence us and we can influence them back. So we talked about understanding the supernatural, and last month we talked about activating the supernatural. And this month, we're going to be talking about walking in the supernatural. And there is a reason for that. Don't forget, I'm doing an introduction in all the stuff that we're, begin, we're going to be talking about in this month. So, I'm hoping that from two months ago, you had at least some understanding of the supernatural. And uh, through the month of April, especially as we went through the 21 days of Activate, that there were some certain things that were activated in your life. But now we need to walk in them. So I don't want you to get bored about hearing about this supernatural. We need to know it. We need to, the supernatural has to become more real to us than the physical. The access that we have to God to influence things on our behalf must be more real to us than the things that we can do for ourselves physically. Hallelujah. You see, Jesus taught his disciples about the supernatural. He actually taught them about the supernatural. He spoke to them a lot about the supernatural. He helped them to understand it. He helped them to know what the supernatural was. In fact, because they were Jews, they already had a, a robust understanding of the fact that the supernatural was really real. You know, for, for, for example, Jesus was talking somewhere, I think in Luke 16, and he was talking about Lazarus, and he said, well, Lazarus died and angels carried him to the bosom of Abraham. His audience were not amazed because they, they, that was understandable to them. The supernatural was a matter of fact to them. But we live in a day and a culture, as we heard last week, that we've been desensitized from the availability of the supernatural. The average believer defaults to what I can explain, science, what I can see, what I can feel, what I can touch. That's what the Bible calls carnal-mindedness. And it says to be carnally minded is death. That is to walk like a natural man, to think like a natural person, it's death. It's spiritual death. Amen. All right, let, let me try. We have unbelievers, people who are not saved, who don't know God, who, whose spirits are dead. They are not alive unto God. But we have believers who are alive unto God, whose spirits are alive, but they are carnal. The Bible calls them carnal-minded believers. They are born again, they are saved, they are on their way to heaven, but they still operate like mere men. The Bible says they will die like mere men. They are carnal. The default is natural. There is a problem. The default is, what can my doctor do for me? There is a financial problem. Oh, what can my bank do for me? It's carnal mindedness. There is an argument with your wife and you're thinking, my wife must be wicked. That's carnal mindedness. Because the person has forgotten that there is a devil who does not want your marriage to work. <laughs> Hey. Are you understanding me? It's kind of mindedness. That person doesn't like me. That's why she's talking to me like that. It's kind of mindedness. 
to hold offense against people, to say, whoa, it is because she doesn't want me, or she is jealous, or that's why she's behaving towards me like that. It's kind of mindedness, because you're not realizing that there is an enemy that wants to drive a wedge between the two of you. So, sometimes when I look at the way believers act, I can tell that they are very carnal. They're thinking everything naturally. Some people get offended, and the person that even caused the offense is not even aware that they are offended. <laughs> and yet, the devil brings out the tort. She doesn't like you, she's jealous, she's that, and then you get more and more angry. Now, the person is long gone. They didn't even know they offended you, and yet you're boiling on the inside. There is an entity that is winding you up <laughs> in order to lead you to destruction. So, anyways, let me come back to my note. <laughs> Hallelujah. Therefore, this is the point that I'm trying to make. We must not behave as carnal people because the spiritual is real. So, Jesus taught his disciples, and they understood. And then he told them that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon them. That is that the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he would activate all of these spiritual things that he has taught them. He would remind them of the things that they have learned. He will guide them into all truth. And Jesus expected that they would walk in the spirit. They would walk in the supernatural. Let me repeat myself. The supernatural is real. You can be led by the Holy Spirit. That is supernatural. You can know what to do supernaturally. How many of you have understood something without knowing how you knew it? You just knew this is what to do. That is supernatural. You know, so I'm not talking about some big old mysterious occurrence that happened to you. Just being led by the Holy Spirit, it is walking in the supernatural. Just receiving direction by the Holy Spirit is walking in the supernatural. Maybe you want to take a journey and the Holy Spirit says, no, don't do that. And then that spares you 10 years of trouble. Maybe you want to get into an investment and, and every of the math looks right and the Holy Spirit cautions you and say, pray about this. And while you're praying, he's like, no, and you don't do it. That may save you from 20 years of embarrassment. You can be led by the spirit and that is supernatural angels can come to your aid i mean we've been stranded many times and we're like god send somebody to help us and the person shows up out of nowhere take us to where we need to go and then you turn back you don't find them anymore angels can come to your aid by the hand of god you can hear a word behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. And you walk in it and you come out on the other side into all of God's plans for your life. That is supernatural. There is healing in the supernatural. You can be healed. You can be made whole. You can have supernatural joy. I mean, you can be in the middle of a storm and everything is right side up and God is creating a calm in you that the world cannot understand. Even the kind of peace that a believer has is supernatural. He says, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, because they cannot receive it, they cannot understand it. Do you know that when you have peace in a storm, it is supernatural? Because that's not the carnal way to act. The carnal way, the human way is to be agitated, to complain, to grumble. Yet you have peace. That is supernatural. Hmm. We must learn to walk as believers. Because like we heard last Sunday, we know the one who controls the system. Aye. This is not all that there is for us. This is not all that there is for us. This is not all that there is for us. The money in your account is not all the money that you have. Are you understanding me? The money that you have in your purse is not all the money that is available to you. It is not all that you see that there is. There is much more that is not seen than what is seen. Elisha was in trouble one day. He was surrounded by enemy folks and, and, and he was round about surrounded and it seemed as though he was going to end his life that day. His servant was very afraid, very agitated. Master, we are done for. That was what he said. And Elisha laughed and said, Lord, open his eyes because it is not that which meets the eyes. 
that exist. There is much more that surrounds us that we cannot see. The Bible says we are surrounded about by the cloud of weakness. There are angels that are innumerable in their company that surrounds you waiting to help your life. You have much more than is physically seen. I need us to understand that and to dwell in that mentality. That is why it is possible for a believer to be at peace even when the world is in turmoil. It is not the two fishes and the five loaves in your hand that you have alone. You have a God who controls this closed system. And in prayer, you can call out to him and he will open a channel that was not visible. There are wells that are located all around you that cannot be seen. And when the time comes, when you need them, God will open your eyes to see them. This is the supernatural. And we can walk in it. We can walk in it. We can walk in it. It doesn't mean that there may be no troubles around. It doesn't mean that you won't pass through the fire or through the flood. But what it means is that when you pass through the fire, it will not kindle on you. When you go through the waters, it will not overflow you. You will not drown in that trouble. No trouble is fashioned and big enough to sink you if you're a child of God. It doesn't mean you will not have people who hate you. <laughs> they will even try to kill you, just like they did with Jesus. But it means that when your time has not come, you cannot go down. Hiya. Are you understanding me? That God has so said it concerning you that he will satisfy you with long life. It means that you will fulfill the time that he has given to you. There is no devil power, powerful enough to kill you before your time. It just cannot happen because God is on your side. Amen. This is what we mean by walking in the supernatural. Something is going on with your child. You don't need to be perplexed. You don't need to call a psychologist or a psychiatrist. First! Call on the name of the Lord because you have resources in heaven that are not yet available on earth. And God, by his power, will help you. Are you understanding what we're saying? The supernatural is available to us. But we must understand it. We must activate it. We must walk in it. As we went through the 21 days of activate, there were many things that had been activated in us. There were many things that God has, has, has opened up in us that we must begin to work in. And as I was thinking about this, the Holy Spirit said to me, the supernatural is like having a credit card <laughs> by which you draw from the bank of heaven. Now listen to this. You must understand how it works. Many of you have got credit cards and you don't actually really know how it works. And that's why many of us are in financial trouble. Amen. Many people don't understand how the plastic cards that they've got work. Praise God. How many of you have got a credit card? Just put it up. Put your hands up. Okay. How does it work? Some think I just spend money on it and I pay back what I can pay back. <laughs> uh, that's not how it works. In fact, many of you do not know the intent behind the design of that card. <laughs> you think that the card is designed to help you. <laughs> the card was designed to make somebody rich. And they give you temporary help. Which if you're not careful, it becomes a problem. Anyways, it's not a financial seminar today. We'll talk about that later. Some of you have credit card debts and you're only paying the minimum balance. And yet, you buy coffee every day. You go to Tim Hortons every day. And spend unnecessary money on other things. Some of you have credit card debt, and yet you're paying 
on other debts that don't have as much interest as what you have on your credit card. It, that tells me you don't understand how your credit card works. Amen. It's too quiet in here now. <laughs> That's why pastors don't talk about money. Because when they start to talk about money, people's, <laughs> people's countenances change. But it is true. Okay, let me ask another question. Don't worry, I'll get to my message now. Let me ask another question. How many of you have credit cards and you know what the interest rate on your credit card is? You know it. For sure, you know exactly the amount that you're interested in. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what you were told. <laughs> Praise God. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll deal with that later. But the funny thing is a credit card can help you. But if that's only if you understand how it works. And you walk it the way it is supposed to work. Let me just give you a very simple because this is church, and we're in church to learn. Let me just give you a very simple, general perspective. Now, of course, we can deal with that in details. If you have a credit card, the way you're supposed to use it is use it as though it's a cash card. You already have the money, or the money is going to come before your statement due date comes. You spend the card, you pay back in full the amount that you spent on it, period. That's the way you are supposed to use a credit card. Except, listen to this, except if whatever you're doing with the credit card will give you more interest or more returns than the interest that you're paying on that card. Except that. And even at that, you must meet up with your payment. If you don't do any of that, it is actually harming you and not helping you. So, that's just wisdom aside. We'll talk about that later. Now, when you get a card, you have to activate it in order to actually be able to use it. And then, even though you understand how it works and you've activated it, you, then, you actually need to use it. This is the way the supernatural is. If we don't understand the supernatural, it may actually hurt us. Is somebody with me? If you don't understand how the supernatural work, it may actually be a source of pain. So that's why we, we talked about understanding and we talked about activate. And now we're really going to talk about, you know, walking in the supernatural. Let's jump right ahead and, and I have a couple of points before we, we close this morning. Walking in the supernatural. What do I need to do to walk in the supernatural that has been activated? All the stuff that has been activated in us, all the things that God has taught us, all the things that we have understood, how can we put it to work? How can we put it to our advantage? So right off the bat, I'll tell you three things. Number one, you are to believe. Number two, you are to be bold. And number three, you are to belong. When you believe, you make the supernatural work for you. When you are bold, you make the supernatural work through you. And when you belong, you make the supernatural available to you. These are the three things that come together to help you walk in the supernatural. Now, don't think you understand what all of that means. Just let me get into it. And I'll stop wherever my time runs out and we'll continue after Mother's Day. Are you with me? Believe. Now, turn your Bibles with me. Before you think that this pastor is just telling us stuff and he's not reading the Bible. <laughs> Matthew chapter 13. I'm going to read from verse 53 to 58. Matthew chapter 13. Let's read from verse 53 to 58. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All right, when Jesus had finished telling these stories and illustration, he left that part of the country and returned to Nazareth, his hometown. When he taught there in their synagogue, everyone was amazed and said, where does he get this wisdom and the power to do miracles? They scoffed. He is just a carpenter's son. 
and we know Mary, his mother, and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. All his sisters live right here among us. Where did he learn all these things? And they were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his own family. And so he did only a few miracles there because of their unbelief. Turn with me to Mark chapter 6. We'll read verses 1 to 6. Same account from a little bit of a different perspective. Mark chapter 6, 1 to 6. Hallelujah. Jesus left a part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Then they scoffed. He is just a carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And his sisters live right here among us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his hometown and amongst his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Can you bear with me? Let's read from Luke chapter 4. Now, when you're studying the Bible and you find a passage, if that passage is available in the other Gospels, if you're reading in the Gospels, try to read that account in the other Gospels because it's going to give you the full perspective. So we've read two accounts. Let's read a third one and then we'll go right in. Luke. Chapter 4 from verse 14. This is a bit of a longer read to 28. When Jesus returned to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power, reports about him spread quickly throughout the whole region. He taught regularly in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah, the prophet, was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has set, sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll and handed it back to the attendant and sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. Then he began to speak to them. The scriptures you have just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Everyone spoke well of him and was amazed by the gracious words that came from his lips. How can this be, they said. Isn't this Joseph's son? Then he said, you will undoubtedly quote me this proverb. Physician, heal yourself. Meaning, do miracles here in your hometown like those you did in Capernaum. But I tell you the truth. No prophet is accepted in his own hometown. Certainly, there were many needy widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the heavens were closed for three and a half years and a severe famine devastated the land. Yet, Elijah was not sent to any of them. He was sent instead to a foreigner, a widow of Zarephath in the land of Sidon. And many in Israel had leprosy in the time of the prophet Elisha. But the only one healed was Naaman, a Syrian. When they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious. Now, this part that we're going to read was not in the other account. Just listen. Jumping up, they mobbed him. And forced him to the edge of the hill on which the town was built. They intended to push him over the cliff. But he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. Then Jesus went to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and taught there in the synagogue every Sabbath day. 
Hallelujah. So my first point, in order for you to walk in the supernatural, is to believe. Somebody say believe. believe. I need you to shout it out loud. Believe. I can't hear you yet. Believe. I need the guys on the balcony to shout believe. believe. Good. Believe. What does that mean? What are we talking about? I'm in church, pastor. I mean, it tells you that I believe. I'm here. Why are you preaching to the choir? I believe. Uh -uh -uh -uh. Not so fast. Before we can walk in the supernatural, or before the supernatural can walk for us, we have to believe. And believe, which is faith, in, in other words, is not just head knowledge. It's not just accepting that this is possible. It's deeper than that. Believing is the currency that you exchange for goods in the supernatural. Follow me now. Believing is that currency that must be taken from you in order for you to receive something from the supernatural. So you have to have it. Are you following me? Jesus says, all things are possible unto him that believes. To him that believes, nothing shall be impossible. It is the medium of exchange. It's like a decentralized currency. For those of you that are into cryptos, everyone has theirs and nobody controls it. You must have yours to exchange for something in the supernatural, especially if you're a Christian that has grown for a while. Are you following me? You must believe in order to walk in the supernatural. And the opposite of believing is unbelief. Unbelief will ruin whatever has been activated in us. So we read three accounts of Jesus going to Nazareth where he grew up and he encountered unbelief. Now those people came to church. They were in the synagogue. They came to hear the word of God being read. Jesus did not preach his own message to them. He read to them from the word of God. Yet, they did not believe. You can be in church and hear the word of God and not believe. So the fact that you are in church does not make you one who believes. You must figure out what do I need to do to believe. What really is believing? And how do I put my belief in place in order to have the supernatural work in my life? Some people think that if there is a great miracle, they will believe. They will automatically be believers. Sometimes we think that if we see miracles happen, everyone will believe. How many of you think about that? How many of you think like that? In fact, I've met atheists who say to me, oh, just show me a miracle and I'll believe. But in God's economy... It doesn't work like that. I, I am actually amazed. See, because when you read the other verses before the passages we read, Jesus had been performing great miracles in other places. In fact, in one of the places, he had just raised the girl from the dead by saying, Talita Kumi. And then he goes to his hometown. They've heard about those miracles, what was done, but they did not still believe. <laughs> Are you following me? So the dead can be raised in this place, in this church, right in your presence, and you will still be an unbeliever. Now, you will think that, no, 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 pastor, come on, what are you talking about? If I see the dead raised, I will automatically believe. But it doesn't work that way. Because it is not head acceptance that dead can be raised. Are you understanding me? Many people know that God can do anything for them, but they still don't believe. Many people have actually seen miracles, great miracles, even in their own lives, but they still don't believe. Are you following me? So the first truth that I need you to know is that great miracles may not prevent unbelief. But unbelief prevents great miracles. Are you understanding me? So, in your life, when you begin to expect the supernatural to work, I need you to know, program yourself to know that for every 
situation that you are trusting God for, you must bring active belief. You can't just assume, because I saw a miracle 10 years ago, I automatically have a belief system for this miracle. Because great miracles may not prevent unbelief. I mean, you know Thomas. No, brother, Thomas here. The one in the Bible. He had seen every, he saw Lazarus raised from the dead. But when they told him, Jesus, the same Jesus who raised somebody from the dead, has come back from the dead. What did he say? I will not believe, except I see the... <laughs> this was a guy who saw somebody who was dead for four days raised. Jesus had not been dead four days. So great miracles do not prevent unbelief. It is unbelief that prevents great miracles. You know, ca can you bear with me a little bit? I I've been talking to people and they say, well, you know, if I saw a miracle and all of that, I'll believe. But I'm like, come on, man, we're in the, the internet age. Go on YouTube. You will find a lot of Benny Hinn's crusades, a lot of crusades from Ray and Bonky, a lot of crusades from even A.A. Allen that were documented, video cameras everywhere, and you see the miracles happen. Why don't they still believe? Unbelief is a deliberate choice. Unbelief is a deliberate choice. So, <laughs> if you're going to walk in the supernatural, every time you come to a situation, listen, you must deliberately decide whether you are going to believe now or not. That's where we fail. Are you understanding me? I hope I can be gentle like Pastor Yuki, but please, let's leave that thing. Listen, in every situation that you come to, you must decide whether you're going to believe or not. The fact that you believed yesterday does not mean nothing. The fact that you saw a miracle yesterday will not work. You must say to yourself in this situation, I choose to believe. It's an active choice. It's not just something ephemeral that is just there and you just, you know, uh, it just happens. No, 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 no. We come to situations with active determination to believe. Look through all the miracles of Jesus. Everyone who came to Jesus and received a miracle from him, they came with active choice that they would believe. Even when you call them a dog, they're like, my daughter has to be healed, sir. I don't care what you call me, my daughter has to be healed. Even when Jesus says, oh, you do not believe, help my home believe, sir. Heal my child. Are you understanding me? Go and check. Everywhere somebody received a miracle from Jesus, they came with active belief. Hallelujah. So, we must, as believers, believe against all who odds. The Bible talks about Abraham that he believed and hoped against hope. So whatever situation you come into, if you want the supernatural to walk on your behalf, you must bring active belief. Are you a believing unbeliever? Believing is shown by actions, not head knowledge. We're going to talk about the law of faith in, active, in, in, in walking in the supernatural down the week. But just agree with me at this point that believing is action, not head knowledge. What you do that shows that you believe. In fact, <laughs> I want to get into something now. The first sign that you are willing to believe is honor. In the passages we read, Jesus says a prophet does not have honor in his hometown. Why did he talk about honor with regards to unbelief? Because the first sign that you are willing to believe a man of God is honor. Listen now. Listen to me. What I mean by honor is this. When you come to <laughs> a point where you need God to walk in your life, your belief is shown in your attitude. And honor is all about attitude. So the first sign that you're willing to believe God is honor. 
The word that we have received, we must believe it. We must act on it. But the word that we receive, most often than not, we will receive from a man. I'm going somewhere. What I'm trying to say is this. Don't just believe God. You must believe the men that God sent. Because the word of God is going to come to you through men. Are you following me? Hiya. Bear with me, please. If you understand this, your Christian life will change completely. Because... Uh, the Bible is talking to us and says, if you're going to say you love God, you can only show it by loving men, the way you love men. In the same way, if you're going to tell me that you believe God, you would only show me by believing the men of God. <sighs> is somebody still here? All right, let, let's read the Bible. Let the Bible speak for itself. Uh, turn to Matthew chapter 10. Let me read a couple of scriptures so that you can understand this. Because I'm not making this up at all. It is God's word. Matthew chapter 10, verse 40 says, Anyone who receives you does what? If you are going to receive Jesus, if you are going to receive God, you must receive the people that he sent to you. And this is where we make the mistake. We want a miracle. We want God to act in our lives. But we are not willing to receive the people that God has sent. Why? It says this very clearly. Anyone who receives me receives the Father who sent me. If you receive a prophet as one who speaks for God, I'm reading from the New Living Translation, you will be given the same reward as a prophet. And if you receive righteous people because of their righteousness, you will be given a reward like theirs. And if you give even a cup of cold water to one of the least of my followers, you will surely be rewarded. So what is Jesus saying? He's teaching us as a church that yes, you are looking for God to do something in your life, but God is going to send people to you and you must receive them in order to receive what you are wanting. Therefore, the first sign of believing, to help your belief, because sometimes you came to church thinking you believe, but then God is sending you a message through his men and his women and you are displaying categorical class A unbelief because you dishonor that, what you, that which you are hearing. So the first sign that you are willing to believe is honor. Many people actually came to Jesus not even sure if they actually believed. But they honored Jesus enough that they received from him. Are you following me? There was a father who brought his son and, and he was saying, please help us. If there's anything that you can do, help us. And Jesus says, if only you believe. And he says, look, just help my unbelief. What did that guy have that is different from us? Is because he, he, he saw something in Jesus and honored it. Even though he did not understand the system of how God does things and how God works and all of that, just because he paid attention to Jesus enough, he himself helped his unbelief and gave him his miracle. The woman with the issue of blood, having heard so many things about Jesus, she does not know too many scriptures and all of that, but she just says, look, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, she had not heard anything about people touching the hem of his garment, I will be healed. That was a system that showed God that this person believed. Why? Because of honor. <laughs> the Bible says, believe God. You will be established. But believe his prophet. You will prosper. And so when Jesus was saying to them. A prophet. Lacks no honor anywhere else. But in his hometown. He is saying. That because we are over familiar. With the people that God sends to us. We dishonor them. And we don't receive nothing. Attitude, as the word of God is being spoken, tells me whether you believe or not. Let, let me explain it this way. Um, let's say Pastor UK comes here and is preaching, and God has given him a word. 
and he's saying somebody will be healed here today. Now, he is just speaking the word of God. What is your attitude to that word? Are you like, oh, that's for me? Or um, I just as a UK, I mean, that brother that jokes with us, I mean, he cannot be speaking for God. That's why many of us don't receive. I, I, am I communicating with you? Is this too difficult to accept? Because God will send his word by a man. He will. So, Bishop comes here and he's talking. You know, somebody has financial issues. God is going to provide. How do you receive that word? Are you receiving it? Oh, brother, Chino, I play football with him. So, come on. I mean, like, what was he talking about? Or are you receiving that? Yeah, God is speaking to me. I believe in the name of Jesus. I, 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 I keep my faith into this. Oh, no. Everywhere Jesus went, they did not know who his brothers were. They honored him. They received his words. But when he came to his hometown, where he grew up, maybe there was some guy called Joseph that he played with. You? You? I mean, I used to kick you around on the street like you're coming here and telling me you will heal us. Come on. I mean. It was the same word. The same word of power. But because they were overly familiar, they could not receive. Believe his servants. And the words that they speak on behalf of God. And it will come to pass in your life. See, believing God is practiced by believing his servants. I cannot, if that's the only thing that you hear today, it will be more than enough. Believing God is practiced by believing his servants. Just as loving God is practiced by loving people. You can't tell me you love God and you're talking in tongues and all of that and then you're wicked to everybody around and nobody can have a peaceful coexistence with you. You, you don't like God. You don't love God. You just love religion and the good music in church. In the same way, you cannot say, I have faith. I believe God and all of that. And a word of prophecy is given to you by his servant and you're like, oh. It doesn't even register. I'm the pastor. When I'm sitting down, somebody else is preaching, I hold on to every word because I know it is not the word of man. It is from, as long as it is the word of God from the scripture, I, 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 my heart is come, bring it, I receive in the name of Jesus because I know that the system God has put in place is that he will reach me through his servant. It, it, it is not something designed to, to worship men. Do you understand? It is not something designed so that some people can be elevated above whoever. In fact, that was one problem in the early church. Paul would write to them. They would be like, who is this Paul, Seth? Who, who is he? You know, I'm talking to my... Who is he? Who, who does he think he is? To tell us what to do in our church and what not to do. Unfortunately, if they don't believe him, they are out. Are you following me? Hmm. It is called honor. When you receive from a prophet, you receive the reward of a prophet. When you receive from a righteous person, you, even if the person is just an ordinary follower, look, if a 12, 10, 11 year old stands here to preach the word of God, by the virtue of the fact that the person is representing God to us, makes him believable. And I have to receive the word from his or her mouth like I am hearing it from God. Are you understanding me? I'm not talking about worshipping people who have set themselves as an omega of the world. No, no, no. That's not what I'm talking about. I am talking about the heart attitude, the, the, the inner composition that we bring to the word of God. Somebody may be singing. They are just singing. They are leading. And they are releasing a word of prophecy that God is going to reach out to you. How do you take that? You are just waiting. Oh, Pastor John is going to come up. I like him better. No, you will be missing out on what God is doing. Because by the virtue of the fact that the person is here, releasing the word of God towards you, that is a key to your miracle or to the direction that you need. 
or to the word that God is trying to get across to you. If you're still waiting for the big pastor to come, you don't understand the systems of God. Am I helping somebody? That's why I say many of us come to church, but we are unbelievers. Believing unbelievers. Because we are not aligning to receiving the word. <sighs> Thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> All right. Believe us. <laughs> Let me just put it that way. And God will honor it. God will. Here is the thing. Somebody said, what you do not honor, you can hardly receive. What you despise will be far from you. Did you see the attitude of those people? They despise Jesus. Who is he? He's a carpenter. I mean, I still have a furniture in my house that you constructed 12 years ago. What do you, what do you mean that God sent you to us? I mean, don't forget, you made the toy that my daughter plays with. I know your mother. Dis, they despised him in their heart. What you despise will move far away from you. Ah, let, me, let me put it this other way. Somebody has a grace, maybe an healing anointing, and you are the one who criticizes him most. The healing anointing will be far away from you. It's just the law of God. Somebody can sing well. Okay? Choir members. And you are jealous. You are the, oh, what is she doing? Is she the only one that can sing? Look at how she's out dipping. That grace will be far from you. Because you don't honor it. It cannot rest on you. It just can't. <laughs> what you attack, you will never attract. You just can't. You see, poor people who don't like rich people, they can never be rich. Just go and check. They just can never be rich. Oh, look, look, because you bought a new car, you're just, you're just, you're just you eat, the new car will be far away from you. <laughs> the way this works in our kingdom is that you celebrate them, you rejoice with them, and then you can attract what they have. You see, somebody has a lot of following on Instagram. Oh, look at her. Yeah, because you have followers, you are just pompous. Hey, followers will be far away from you. Because that attitude will drive them away. Go and check. Those who have many followers, it is because they love those people who have many followers. In fact, they go and socialize on their platforms and their followers will come and follow them. It's just a system of life. But no, that person, because they have, you don't talk to them, you don't, you know, they will, followers will be far away from you. <laughs> it's just the law of life. What you despise will move far away from you. What you attack, you will not attract. Some of you hate your boss. You just don't like them. They've not done anything against you. But just because they are the manager, you don't like them. Don't worry. The managerial position will be very far away from you. <laughs> and if by crook or hook you get in there, people will despise you. Because whatever you sow, you reap. Even as a Christian, in fact, your own harvest has fertilizer in it. <laughs> Do you understand that? Recompense comes to the believer very quickly. Why? Because there are demons who want to supervise your tears. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Do, do you understand that? Do you understand what I'm saying? Come to the word of God with an attitude to receive. With honor in your heart. That look, you are not seeing the person or the boy or the girl. You are seeing that God is using this person as a channel to reach me. And I would believe his word. Now, if the person comes and they are saying nonsense that is not on, in, in the word of God, of course. You, you know, I mean, like, you don't have to receive that. But if they are communicating the truth of God's word to you, especially when you know their track record to be people who are humble, to be people who are committed to the truth of God's word, and you sat indifferent, it will be difficult to walk in the supernatural. Why? Because obedience is tied to honor. For example, if I say to you, God will bless you this week, give. 
If you honor that word, you will go and give. And the blessings of God will follow. But if you are indifferent to the word, oh, who is talking? I know him. I mean, like, he plays football with me. What's that? And you go away. Of course, you will not obey. You will not do what needs to be done. Sometimes we invite men of God to come and share and all of that. You, you die. Change your perspective. Lean in. Honor the word that is coming. Because we will not just bring just any kind of person to come and speak to you. If somebody cannot be a blessing to me, I will not ask them to come and bless you. Amen. Ah, uh, all right. I have to close. Give me five minutes. I'll share the two points quickly, and then we'll take the communion and we'll close. Number, the second thing I, I need to talk about, we're going to talk about the law of faith and all of that later, but, and, and we'll be able to give you a little bit more. But the second thing is that we have to be bold. So, having received all of this activation, you have to be bold. In Acts chapter 4, from verse 29 to 31, we saw the disciples who had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit praying for boldness. Asking God for boldness to help them to be bold. Why? We have activated the supernatural and the way the supernatural can walk through us is that we have to be bold. You have to pray for boldness. Even after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, even after things have been activated in you, because without boldness, great potentials are not utilized. It's very simple. God may give you the gift of healing. You have it, it's there, it's activated, it's burning in your bones. And then you walk into and the Holy Spirit says to you, that person is sick, go pray with them. And you're like, Holy Spirit, I'm in Timothy's. And in Canada, people don't like seeing people pray in public. Uh, I don't want to disgrace myself. And then you don't pray for the person and you left. The potential is there. That it has been activated. But it will never get utilized. Are you understanding why they were praying for boldness? Just read Acts 4, 29 to 31. I don't have time to read it. But they asked God to help them to be bold. To declare the gospel in boldness. Why? Because without boldness, all that you have believed for will not come out. Because great potentials will not be utilized without boldness. You need boldness to use the gifts that you have received. I want to challenge somebody today to, to become bold. Amen. You don't have to ask the permission of anybody in order for you to be bold. It takes boldness to use the power and the potential that is inside. It takes boldness to declare the word of God, to preach the gospel, to lay hands on the sick so that they recover, to say that. God is going to do this for me and to say it publicly. We have to be bold. If we are held back with the spirit of fear and timidity, we need to pray that God will change that for each one of us so that we can be bold. We have to be bold in our prayers. You know, many times we pray small prayers. We pray safe prayers so that if God does not answer, God is not disgraced. We, we try to help God. By saying, well, this may be too big because I'm not sure if God is going to answer. So if he doesn't answer, well, let's just be safe. Lord, please um, heal him. But uh, if you don't just take him home peacefully. Huh? What kind of nonsense is that? Be bold until God tells you otherwise. Amen? If you are conflicted as to, is this God's will? Is this not God's will? No, just be bold with what you want until God says otherwise. So listen to this practically. If somebody were sick and I'm praying for them, I am praying for them to be healed. And I will keep praying for them to be healed until God says, hey, brother, I need them home. Leave them alone. This is how the Christian life works. Pray for what God's word has said with boldness until he himself tells you otherwise. If I have a financial trouble, I am praying for the supply to come supernaturally. All these little prayers that we pray, stops the supernatural from being at work. If I'm applying for a job, I'm praying to get it and for everybody else to be disqualified. It's none of my business. If the other person is a believer, let him pray as well. Until God says, hey, I don't want you in that office. That's not the job that I want for you. Then I relax. 
Many people, before we tell them, oh, I'm not sure if it is the will of God, you know, let, let's, let's find the will. God said in his word what his will is already. Pray that until he tells you otherwise. That is the way it works. <laughs> uh, somebody's like, Pastor, is too hard on us today. Forgive me. <laughs> but do what I say. <laughs> Amen. Be bold in your prayers. Be bold in your faith. Be bold in your witness. Be bold in your visions and in your plans. Some of you, your plans are too small. Too small. If your plan is small, God will help you achieve it. <laughs> and if your plan is nothing, God will help you to achieve nothing. It is better to be bold with your vision and your dreams and your plan and you fall short than to be small in your plans and you achieve it. Hi. Is somebody getting blessed? I'm about to close. I can keep you here till the evening. You know that already. But somebody is not yet full. I know some people are full already. They are sleeping. Some people are still with. They are still like, Pastor, I, I need the last point. Be bold in your prayers. The worst that can happen is what? Nothing. If sister was sick and I'm praying for her to be healed, the worst that can happen is that nothing happens. And it is not my business. It's God's business. Brother, I prayed in the name of Jesus and Jesus did not do anything. Is it my problem? It's not. It's God's problem. <laughs> did I pray in my name? I did not pray in my name. So why, why should I be afraid? The worst that can happen is nothing. I meet you in the mall and the only thing lays on my heart to pray for you. I pray for you. The worst that can happen is, oh, that pastor prayed for me and nothing happened. So what? Is it my name? Be bold in your confession. Why are you confessing small things? Apostle Paul was so bold that, look, he says, I will preach the gospel to everyone that comes across my path. I'm like, this guy, what, what are you talking about? Everyone in the world? Yes. Be bold with your confession. The worst that can happen is nothing. Ah, but here is what we do know. That when we commit God, God is committed. Be bold. Change your prayers from God if you like. God, if you, if, if, if you know, you have his word already. He's told you what he likes, what he wants for you. Pray it until he tells you otherwise. Be bold in your prayers. Be bold in your faith. Be bold in your weakness to others. Walk across the room. You're in a place and the Holy Spirit puts it in your heart. Go talk to that lady about Jesus. Go right ahead. The worst that can happen is you say she's not interested. And that's okay. Because she's a free will moral agent. She can say she's not interested in Jesus. And that's fine. Amen. But when we are bold, we will see God's hand. You, amen. As we begin to go out and be bold in our weakness, you will see people give their life to Jesus Christ in the mall with tears, saying, I have been waiting all my life for somebody to preach the gospel to me like this. The devil tries to incapacitate us with fear. He says, we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. The spirit of fear is bondage. Praise God. Let's be bold in love. Some people have become so timid about loving others. Love boldly. Love people with boldness. Show kindness boldly. Let's love boldly. Don't hold back. Love other people with boldness, with reckless abandon. Yes, people have hurt me. Yes, people have not treated me well. Yes, people have, you know, leave that behind. Go on and love people with boldness. The worst that can happen is you get hurt. Jesus will heal your heart. Be bold. The one that has an experience, I said this before, is not at the mercy of the one who has an argument. There is nobody on the face of the earth that I cannot preach the gospel to. The worst that they can say is, I'm not interested. Or argue, 
and argue and argue. The one that has an experience with God is not at the mercy of the one who has an argument. We've never been at the mercy of anyone who has an argument. Because God is real. And his power in our life is real. So let's be bold. And finally, as I wrap this up, is that you need to belong. You know, I told you when you believe, the supernatural would work for you. When you are bold, you will make the supernatural walk through you. But when you belong, you make the supernatural available to you. The supernatural will not be available to you until you truly belong to Christ. Do you really belong to Jesus? We're going to take the communion now. And this communion is a sign, is a covenant that we belong to Jesus. Do you really belong to Jesus? Have you given your life to Jesus completely, over to him? Have you? Are you just in church just because it is the customary thing for you to do? To walk in the supernatural, you ought to, you must belong to Jesus. I do not have time to tell you about the seven sons of Scaphir who went to try to cast out a demon and the demon said to them, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. Who are you? You don't belong to Jesus. So how can I listen to you? The supernatural will not work for you. It will not be available to you except you belong. And it is very easy to belong to Jesus. It is just to commit your life completely to him and say, from henceforth, I will follow you. So I don't know what your situation is right now. If you don't truly belong to Jesus, today is that day you need to make that decision. Get all in. Get all in. And I promise you, because this is God's word. It says, as many as believes him, he gives them what? Power to become sons and daughters of God. If you decide to believe, to belong to Jesus, you would receive power. This is what he gives to us. Power to become sons of God. To live a different life. Do you really belong? I'm not asking if you come to church. I'm not asking if you've been attending church. But do you really belong to Jesus? Let today be that day that you make up your mind to say, I am all in for Jesus. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 11 as we take the communion. And it's going to be a message to someone who wants to belong. Who wants to become part of the body of Christ. Who wants to say, Jesus, I need you to have all of me. And then we will pray and close. 1 Corinthians 11 Verse 23, for I pass to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, that is, those who belong to him, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So, anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick and some have even died. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet, when we are judged by the Lord, 
we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So my dear brothers and sisters, when you gather for the Lord's Supper, wait for each other. This communion is for everyone who belongs to Jesus. And the only examination that I want, you, I want you to do today is, do I belong to Jesus? Do I truly belong? And if you don't belong, just say, Jesus, I want to belong to your body. Because this body is broken for you. So that you might become a part of his body. Amen. So let us rise as we take the communion together. And then we'll close. Hallelujah. Can you declare with me? This is the body of our Lord Jesus. It is broken for us. As we break it and eat it, we walk in the supernatural. Our bodies are protected. We are part of the body of Jesus. And we walk in his power. In Jesus' name. Can you eat it together? Hallelujah. We take this cup. <laughs> it is a covenant rectified by the blood of Jesus. So please declare with me, this is the blood of Jesus that confirms his covenant for me. As I drink it today, <laughs> I walk in dominion. I walk in the supernatural. I am forgiven of my sins. I am cleansed of my shortcomings. And Jesus is my righteousness. Amen. Can you drink it together? Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you because you're teaching us to walk in the supernatural. I pray in the name of Jesus that a grace to believe, to believe your word at every instance will rest upon us in Jesus' name. Like Peter, we will say, at thine word, and we will do what you have asked us to do. Let that grace rest upon each one in the name of Jesus. Father, I ask that you will grant us the spirit of boldness. Many of us have now shrunk away from presenting the gospel, from sharing Christ because of fear. Lord, from today, help us to be bold. To be bold at home, to be bold with our neighbors, to be bold in our places of work, to be bold on the street when we go out, when we come in, in the name of Jesus. We are bold in our prayers. We are bold in our faith. We are bold in our vision. We are bold in the proclaiming of the gospel. We are bold in laying hands on the sick to see them recover. We are bold in asking for signs and wonders. We are bold in asking for miracles. We are bold in challenging the unconventional and bringing it to bear in our society. We are bold in calling upon the name of the Lord and proclaiming his name in the name of Jesus. I pray, O oh God, for everyone who has made a decision to truly belong to Jesus, who has taught in their heart that they want Jesus and they want to belong to him, I release to them today the power to be the children of God, the power to walk as children of God in the name of Jesus. Everyone who is in this assembly, in this church, who has not truly, truly turned over their lives and the governing of their lives to Jesus. We enable them right now to begin to do so in the name of Jesus. And I proclaim over this church in the name of Jesus, in the month of May, we walk in the supernatural. Let there be supernatural direction. Let there be divine healing. Let there be divine provisions. Let there be divine favor. That which we have waited for for many years in this month, let it come to us. In the mighty name of Jesus, let there be divine salvations. Ah, let people experience that the giftings that have been activated in their lives over the month of April begins to come to walk in the name of Jesus. Let there be divine revelations, visions, the word of prophecy, the word of knowledge, the gift of healings, the gift of faith in the name of Jesus. Let there be designing of spirit. 
in the name of Jesus. Someone who is about to make a critical mistake, the Lord will intercept them and redirect them in the name of Jesus. I proclaim over this assembly that we walk in the supernatural in the name of Jesus. Our businesses and our jobs are visited by the hand of God in the name of Jesus. We decree safety for each one. Wherever we may be, whether we travel by air, by sea, by road, in any form, shape, or way, we, de- we release safety and decree that our home is safe. Our children, they are safe. The hand of the enemy is far away from us in the name of Jesus. You are blessed. You are blessed. Aye. You are blessed. Blessed beyond every curse in the name of Jesus. Your children, they are blessed in the name of Jesus. Your resources, they are blessed in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you because you have heard us. Thank you because you make a way where there is no way. Thank you because every roadblocks are removed now, now, now. Now, every delay is removed in the name of Jesus. Oh, come on, I need someone to shout an amen. Every delay is removed. Everything that we have waited for for too long, it has become too long. It has become too long. I release a word of prophecy today to remove that roadblock, to remove that delay. I release angels to go on your behalf to search it out, to bring it to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. God bless you. The service is dismissed. See you on Wednesday.